Hello, good evening, everyone. And it is my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's discussion on Black Perspectives on International Relations. I will be your, I will be the chair for tonight's conversation. My name is Dr. Jenna Marshall. I'm a lecturer in the Department of European and International Studies at King's College London. And here we have our esteemed panel of speakers, um, both in 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 um, on the stage as well as virtually. Just a few housekeeping um, notes to mention. Like to pose questions during the Q and A session. Please remain seated. Someone will approach you, um, and you can pose your question. Then, please be very succinct as possible, and so that we can have as many questions as possible. After tonight's event, there will be a reception um, from 6 until 8 p.m. And this is to celebrate a curated project, Black Britain Beyond. It will showcase a, a selection of Black cultural archive por portraits, illuminating the talent and pipeline of next generation leaders in the Black British community. So please do stay on for that after tonight's discussion. So on to tonight's speakers. We have virtually Catherine Inwagia, sorry, let me try this one more time. Um, Catherine Nuwagia Akudahu, a director of programs for the Overseas Development Institute. And here with me to my Immediate left, we have Dr. Owino Okesh, Associate Professor of Political Sociology at SOAS University of London, and Bell Ribiero Adi, Member of Parliament for Stratham. So, just one last point we will have five minutes of interventions from each speaker, followed by a panel discussion. And then we will open up to both in-person uh, questions and if there are any questions from those of you attending online. So Catherine, if you would like to begin with your five minute intervention. Thank you very much. And uh, good evening, uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. And many thanks for this kind invitation to speak to you today uh, during Black History Month. Uh, on the issue of Black voices in international uh, relations. Uh, I'm sorry I'm not able to be there in person. I would have very much loved to be there, uh, but it couldn't make it this time. So um, I want to begin uh, first with a short uh, biography because I think it's, it's important uh, when we speak about things Black or when we as Black people um, uh, talk about our experience, um, that we acknowledge that Black is as much a condition uh, as a racial category, um, and that by virtue of our lived experiences, we carry the weight of that condition differently. So I say this at a time when, in light of um, the arrival of the first non-white prime minister of this country in office, tongues are wagging, waxing and waning lyrical about the wider significance of the event. Much has been said about from whence Rishi Sunak hails. I will say no more. Let me um, turn to my own uh, background. So I was born in Glasgow. You wouldn't tell so from my accent, but I haven't always spoken like this. I was born in Glasgow to Igbo Nigerian parents uh, who had left their country separately sponsored uh, by uncle in the case of my dad, an Irish Catholic nun in the case of my mum, uh, to study in Glasgow and Newcastle respectively. They'd never intended to settle in the UK, uh, but eventually married in Scotland and ended up having four children there, and I was the fourth heavily invested in learning, education, and personal advancement. Um, most of us, uh, most of my siblings went on to higher education, as did I. 
from the age of five um, after a short stint uh, in Nigeria, where which went a bit pear-shaped as my mum couldn't find appropriate work after the Biafran War, we were on the wrong side. So after, after that, from the age of five, I grew up mainly in London, went to school there, formed my uh, long-lasting friendships there and became politically minded there. And it was there that questions of race, being black, what it meant to be black or did not, informed my adolescence uh, and my young adulthood. I went on to study history and French at the University of Ang East Anglia, was fortunate of, to go and spend a year abroad in a French speaking Caribbean country where I taught English, and then went on to study area studies Africa with a focus on politics in West Africa at SOAS. So I went after that to have a peppered career in international development, uh, which for me was a ticket to get to know Africa better um, and to immerse myself in worlds which were black, uh, in which black was majority. Because uh, I remember, um, you know, I was always quite uncomfortable uh, with this black Britishness in which I was a minority. I remember carrying that quite heavily, that ethnic minority status. And so it was always, it was, it was enriching, uh, empowering for me uh, to at least appear to be one of many. Um, so fast forward now uh, to, to, you know, what's that got to do with what we're talking about, black perspectives on questions international? Well, Today, after escapades inside and outside academia, working for NGOs, governments, multilateral institutions, I find myself in the illustrious position of being director of a leading UK think tank uh, uh, and, and managing and heading the politics and governance team, no less. Um, at a time when 60, uh, you know, the 60 year old plus institution is in the throes of its own transition trying to shed its post-colonial skin and striving to be a global affairs think tank of relevance to rich and poor countries alike, where questions that concern us all, equity, inequality, injustice, climate uh, crisis, the challenges of living in digitalized societies are, you know, are, are pressing issues that all of us want to turn our attention to. It's also at this time uh, that the organization I'm working for is seeking to take questions of race and racial justice seriously. Uh, what it calls, um, refers to as decolonization. So I've been tasked with leading the charge. I'm chairing a, a, a task force, uh, which is responsible for decolonizing our research and policy work. Um, and I did this very reluctantly, you know, um, but uh, succumbed uh, to the challenge uh, because for all the years, you know, I've been working in international development since 1994, of all the years I've been working in this space, I've been complaining about the absence of serious consideration or a serious grappling with questions of race in the aid sector. So, you know, I had to jump, I had to jump at the chance, I suppose, uh, to, to, to make some important changes. The George Floyd moment, Black Lives Matter and its internationalization clearly has moved us a few steps forward. So conversations about race are beginning to, or not just beginning, are, are being heard increasingly louder um, and, and in some cases clearer. So the pent up frustrations about the white gaze are being aired openly. So this is definitely something I believe that would suggest we, we're moving forward and new policies and new strategies on diversity and inclusion are all over the place. OK, but is the glass half full or half empty? My answer to that question that I'm asking myself almost every day is that actually, I don't believe we've even begun to get our fingers around that would be glass. So we are doing incredible things. Re reviewing how we're staffing our organizations, creating awareness about unconscious bias, and so on and so forth, introducing policies which would take, you know, which would, would which forefront the importance of questions of racial justice and need to rethink the way we produce knowledge. All good. However, 
there are some fundamental questions that obviously remain unanswered. And these are to do with power, the way international relationships between nations are structured, um, and the deep asymmetries that have deep, long, and, 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 and ever widening roots actually. Um, and, and, I, and I really, I will, I'll finish my five minute, over five minute introduction, but just saying, you know, I think it was very telling um, you know, in February 2023 will be at one on anniversary of the Russia-Ukraine conflict and the, the drama, the, 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 the enacting of the racial politics of international relations was played out in that refugee moment that we all recall when would-be third country nationals were not able to be part of the trains that were moving out, were being pushed back. And, um, you know, I think it's an important screensaver that we should all um, be pondering as we think about racial or the questions of race and black perspectives in international relations. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Catherine. So on to Irina. Um, thank you. And I don't think my university will be happy if I don't jump onto that moment and say, look at what source University of London produces. These are our graduates. Um, so I'm Awino Cage and I'm Kenyan, African, and I teach at source University of London. I'm going to offer three provocations uh, as, as a way of opening up the conversation this uh, afternoon. And the first is obviously to state the obvious that, you know, many of us uh, who come from the, the majority world, uh, who live and work here, are sitting and observing with uh, uh, a little bit of bemusement the, the ongoing politics in the United Kingdom. That bemusement is not because we are ungrateful uh, at, at being here and, and the opportunities that are provided by virtue of bringing in our expertise as expatriates to the, uh, to the country and in service of uh, the international community, as well as the local community here. But it's because it reminds us of the broader conversations that many of us have been having on the African continent and elsewhere about the real meaning of democracy. I think one of the questions that has often been raised is that those of us in the majority world have not quite figured out what this democracy question is. And we need to be trained accordingly. We need to, our systems need to be made a little bit tighter and better in connection to voting, in connection to our constitution, our laws, to move away from ethno-nationalist politics as a way to frame the division and the contestation of resources in our countries. But can we see that the same conversations that have been sort of imposed on the majority world in relation to figuring out democracy are playing out in this very context today? So when we ask the question, what can Black perspectives of international relations offer? I think what they can offer is continuous conversations that we've had in multilateral spaces, whether it's in the United Nations, whether it's in connection to our bilateral relations with countries such as the United Kingdom and the United States around equality and inequalities, and which at the heart of that uh, sits the question of power. The UK political situation at this particular moment is forcing us to pay deep attention to the question of structural inequality. Uh, my colleague has just talked about the excitement or non-excitement, depending on what side of the fence you might be sitting on in relation to the current uh, prime minister, who I discovered this morning is actually my age mate, um, you know, who is the prime minister of this country. Now, for some people, they see this as evidence of post-racialism. For some people, we will say, let's hold on a minute. We saw what happened across the pond with Barack Obama, right, where the, the, the first black president of the United States that was a very important political moment for the country and for the globe. I'm Kenyan, so we sort of always claim uh, uh, cousinhood to Barack at, at every single moment. But yet the fact that immediately after Barack's two terms, what we see is Trump emerging and Trumpism emerging as a result of that tells us the nature of resistance that is baked into our societies when what are described as racial minorities take the seat of power or begin to challenge us to think about how our societies are structured. So when we say, for instance, as uh, when democracy experts come to Kenya 
and try and observe our elections and, and offer deep analysis about how Kenyans are moving away from ethnic-based politics. Can we not argue that there's a strong debate on ethno-nationalism happening in this country at the moment? There's a strong debate that is happening here about who owns Britain, who has the right to, to, to occupy particular seats of power, who is the true British person. There actually should be no reason why your Sunaks and others should be making a case for how much Britain has given them and how much they want to give back, give back rather, if there wasn't a contestation about what Britishness looks like and means and how that is racialized. And therefore the justification through gratitude, through uh, uh, espousing British values, through distancing yourself from what is now claimed to be wokeness, which is really just people who are asking critical questions about the nature of inequalities uh, of our societies. That would not be happening if at the heart of this conversation was one in which we are being forced to look deeply at how our societies are deeply racialized and gendered to consistently put on the sidelines communities that are considered to not belong, communities that are considered uh, only useful when they're producing labor, when they're servicing our factories, when they're servicing our universities, like I am at the moment, your wonderful source, University of London, that I'm teaching you know, your young people, um, or when they're servicing our corporate sector. So there's an idea around the valuable immigrant vis-a-vis -vis the ones that we do not want, and therefore we block them at the borders. We are proud when we set up migration policies that seek to guard the borders and determine which is the right immigrant and which is the wrong immigrant. So which brings me to the second point, which is around the crisis of multilateralism. So if we are saying the UK moment presents us with an opportunity to think about democracy and its true meaning and what we can learn from the African continent who have been raising these questions about the lie of democracy and elections as the sort of the only prism to think about the distribution of resources, then the current moment, both in relation to the UK, the United States, as we watch the sort of uh, uh, concerted uh, effort by you know, Trump and the afterlives of the Trump regime, and uh, how that has extended even to the ways in which you know, the, the, the US and other you know, larger countries are engaging with the question of U Ukraine and Russia. These two particular moments force us to question what the current moment is telling us about multilateralism. And the moment of multilateralism that is forcing us, that we, that we are being forced to look at keenly, again, is one that I would argue that many of us in the majority world have been raising in relation to how we are positioned, whether it's in the United Nations or whether it's in relation to the global economy that consistently place particular countries on the receiving end of global aid, on the receiving end of economic policies and, and economic governance uh, infrastructure, that consistently places them on the back foot. And I think the COVID-19 crisis, for instance, allowed us to see that this is not a question of a begging bowl. It allowed us to see how these inequalities are really hardwired into the infrastructure of our multilateral system to consistently place particular parts of the world on the back foot. When African countries said, we have money, what we need is the patent so that we can create our vaccines. What all, no, 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 that's not happening, right? So it was easier for, the, for, for those behind uh, uh, the production of vaccines, for those who are much more invested in protecting the health of their countries as though COVID-19 was not going to cross borders to, to ensure that they held onto the economic uh, benefit that would emerge from controlling vaccines to the detriment of the public health factor that would continuously create a situation where the health inequalities and the socioeconomic inequalities that are seen right now uh, continue to manifest as a result of COVID-19. So I will leave it there. Thank you. Really important points being raised, questions of thinking through democracy, thinking about citizenship in its, in its broader context. So we had a, a personal anecdote, we went more to the global, and now if um, uh, MP Riviero Adi can speak to the UK context. Well, um, I think one of the reasons why, sorry, I'll get that out of me now. I think one of the reasons why we're not uh, taking black voices as, as 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 seriously as we should do in international 
um, relations is because at most levels, a lot of things are being done tokenistically. And because people are conflating diversity with representation. Um, diversity is great. I think it's important that we see different people um, that, that are different in many different ways reflected in, in different areas, but representation means something entirely different. For example, um, I won't talk about the current prime minister, could get myself into some trouble, but I'll talk about three female prime ministers that we've had. Under the three female prime ministers that we've had, and in, in, actually particularly the last one, she made a real mess of it. Under those three female prime ministers, we didn't see a massive change for women. We didn't see women all of a sudden um, rise up um, it, it, into the ranks of high earners. It change didn't come um, that that quickly, and we saw them being discriminated against still um, at, at high levels and, and and facing poverty, not just in the UK but across the world. So when we talk about diversity, people looking, people being different, looking different, and being in different spaces is great because it's important to see society reflected um but for representation to be truly reflected when people get into those positions they have to take the interests of those individuals with them and unfortunately that's that's not that's not happening it strikes me that governments um and institutions generally are not making effort to change things and change the different reflections um when it comes to international relations in particular because it actually benefits them the way it is now capitalism um, has generally been held together um, but by, by discrimination, and it has been for centuries, uh, and, and race itself being a social construct, biologically there's no such thing. I remember first hearing that, um, that, that there's no race but the human race, I thought that's really nice, that's really cuddly, um, but, but biologically there is actually um, no race but the human race, but we were, we, that, that social construct was put into society to justify the enslavement of African peoples and, and thereby people of colour and belittling them um, all over the world for, for different forms of subjugation and, and allowing for those countries to be to be colonised. And that has been the basis of, of, of capitalism right across the world. So changing that, changing that um, kind of landscape, changing um, that situation where we have more equality doesn't actually uh, help maintain the systems that have been set up in the way that they have. I mean, it's great. We have a United Nations but we have a security council. So what's the purpose of the other countries uh, there? And every single gain that we've seen in terms of racial justice and, 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 and representation at, at a high level, with ending slavery, ending, en ending colonialism, um, civil rights struggles of, of, of black and brown people in Western countries, all of those have been, had to be fought for um, with blood. And when we look uh, back at how that, that racism continues to play out, um, people, people, at times in this country don't think about how much the issues we face here are linked to how people are seen abroad. Now, if you look at somebody in Africa that looks like me and think they are lesser than you, of course you're gonna treat me uh, with discrimination here. And, 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 and that plays out in how we, how we fund things, how we do things. So, so aid at the moment um, has become an industry. Um, I very much believe that there are many NGOs continue to be well-meaning, but they're, they're all competing against each other. Um, you've seen the private sector now come into the NGO sector. And what do we know about anything that has to do with, with, with that, that is a business that has shareholders? There is supply and there is demand. And effectively to be able to, to, be able to ensure that these businesses stay afloat, they need to keep supplying people that need this aid. And that doesn't seem to me to be bringing about an end to some of the difficulties that people um, face right across the world, but particularly in the, in, in the global South. And, and every time there are attempts by, 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 by countries to come together and, 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 and push forward in, in certain ways, they're, they're really disregarded again, because they don't, they don't fit this particular narrative. So I think about a few years back, the, um, the UK Trade Africa, the UK Africa Trade Summit that was dubbed the scramble uh, for Africa. Uh, we had the prime minister then, um, two prime ministers ago now, Boris Johnson uh, go, and, and he, he's, his speech made it sound like he wasn't listening to African leaders at all. He made no reference to Africa's past and, and the, 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 the horrible role that the UK had had in it. And actually he made no reference to Africa's uh, future or the African common market. Now when established, the African common market is gonna be the largest free trade area in the world with um, a workforce 
that well over a billion that will rival India and, and China. Now imagine what that could be like and imagine how arrogant you'd have to be to completely just disregard it and, 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 and ignore it. Um, and this is when we see countries right across Africa being amongst the fastest growing economies in, 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 in the world. And, and you know, you've really heard about how we keep operating in the, in the system of, of, of debt. I, I, I listened to a very, very interesting video a couple of days ago uh, where they talked about why, um, you know, what, why the UK, the US, other Western nations have, have huge amounts of debt, but they're not, uh, they're not in the same position that some other countries uh, in the global south are. And the clear, explana clear explanation, whose explanation I've ever heard of this, is because their debt is their own. Their debt is in dollars. If they want to pay it off, they can just print more dollars. African debt is in dollars. They have to pay it back because it's not their own currency. And that system is deliberately um, um, set up. But what we have to realize is, I'm thinking about you, you, um, kind of touching on, on the pandemic and how things have changed. Actually, um, countries in, 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 in Africa and in the Caribbean did so much better uh, in the pandemic than we did here. We lost many more lives um, by percentage. So did the US. Um, and, and that was even with the serious vaccine nationalism that we saw. Uh, you, 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 know, you know, you touched on the issue of, of actually needing a, a better global public health model to ensure that these that the, the, the coronavirus didn't cross borders. And even in spite of that, even in spite of the fact that it could be so harmful to us, we weren't going to give it out because it affected people's bottom line. And that just shows how, how awful um, that this system has become. And what, and what we have to remember is that every time um, different countries achieve um, and, and that they're able to survive uh, with, with, without the, the assistance, and, and, and quite often that is what's happening, um, we have to remember that whilst here we're, we're pandering to nationalists, countries um, right across Africa, right across the global south, have their own nationalists. They have their own nationalists and um, every one of them are going to tell you about their achievements one day in spite of their former colonizers. And they're going to say it's not because of aid or because of the privilege of formerly being colonized. And when that happens um, in, in a global context, it, it's going to cause problems for a country like ours, for example, that has left its largest trading partner. Uh, we've left the EU. Uh, Brexit was apparently done. We're still doing it by my estimations. But we've left our largest trading partner. And you would think that if we were sensible, we would look towards those other uh, forced, other countries that we forced uh, English upon and we'd look to them, but instead we continue to treat them with disrespect. Now, I'm one person who firmly believes um, that if you are going to, to go out into the world and, and make friends, you need to treat them as your equals, to treat people in these countries as your equals. And in order to do that, you're going to have to re respond to uh, some of the atrocities of the past. And, and the way to do that, obviously, is, is, is reparations. You need to look at reparations. You need to look at what's... You need to return things that don't belong to you. You need to do all of these different things uh, to show that level of equality. But as I started with, that level of equality, there's no willingness for that level of equality to be shown because it doesn't benefit those who have the most power. So that's why we find ourselves um, in, the way, in the way we do. I don't want to go on for too long. Um, I think I'll, I'll, I'll leave it. I'll leave it there. Okay, okay, brilliant. Thank you. Really important points there. Questions of restitution and reparations for how we then include Black voices and how that could potentially impact decision making at the international level. Uh, you you provided a few statistics earlier about um, the continent, and I have a question here that I'll pose to all three of you, and you can respond as as you like. Will an African century bring Black perspectives on international relations to the fore of the geopolitical agenda. So how, how do we conceive of or think about the idea of an African century? And will that be enough to galvanize further change in terms of decision making with the inclusion of Black voices? Um, Catherine, would you like to begin with that? Yes, I can take a stab at that. I mean, <clears throat> um, thank you for the for the question, and I really enjoy listening to the other panelists. Um, I, I I I spend a lot of my uh, working life, part of, especially since COVID um, has uh, enabled us to start to travel again, 
engaging um, internationally, going to conferences and so on. And I'm always astounded um, at the challenging absence <clears throat> of, of uh, powerful African voices in those gatherings. Um, and, 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 and worried actually about, um, about that as a, as a, as a phenomenon. I, I've been doing a lot of work on tech, um, attending some quite major tech gatherings, Davos, another one recently in San Francisco. And if African voices are not there and at the table, <clears throat> the marginalization, the structural marginalization about which both panelists spoke um, runs the risk of, of, of becoming even more severe. And I do think, you know, if you look at, okay, Africa is a continent, notwithstanding the African common market to be, um, but Africa is a continent uh, of, of, of nations, um, India, is not, it is a country. <clears throat> but when you do see um, the way in which um, Indian uh, business um, political weight is um, evident on that international stage <clears throat> uh, and, and, and Africa is absent, you know, there it's, it, it, it's clear that there are some very important challenges. And I say that because uh, when I when when I think of the Africa century, it's clear that until um, economically, um, Africa as a continent is making uh, taking take is enable is able to really capitalize on uh, uh, that econ economy of scale and carry its weight economically, internationally, that questions of race and race equality will never uh, really be resolved. Um, and, you know, the, those, that the interconnectedness between um, respect domestically in this country and weightiness um, are, are, is clear. And whilst not wanting to be, um, you know, negative, when I look at the um, the African continent um, and 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 the developments politically um, and economically, the weight of China, Russia, Turkey, um, and the challenge of indebtedness, um, whilst there are lots of positive trends, um, just like. I think in the in the 90s, the Africa Renaissance was much heralded and then and then um, seemed to be increasingly hollow. I, I would I, I would caution um, against um, a, a kind of an over enthusiastic imagining of an African century unless um, it is um, kind of um, guided by uh, a close look at the ways in which power and economics are being restructured on the continent. Whilst I wouldn't want to say, you know, it's it's a rehashing of the Cold War, um, you know, um, I think there are resonances that are really important to pay close attention to. So I'm not sure if, uh, even though demographically it is clear um, that there are advantages that Africa has that um, could potentially be taken advantage of, but um, I, 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 I'm, I'm unconvinced as of yet that we're, we're, we're in the in in a place where that African century uh, will will become a reality. Okay, okay brilliant. Thank you. Um, would you like to also respond to that question? Yeah, sure. So two quick points. I, I was struck uh, by the commonality of political positioning of African and Caribbean heads of state at the United Nations General Assembly around the positioning of African countries and Caribbean countries within the United Nations, the questions of the Security Council, questions around reparations, there's a sort of very consistent messaging. I'm certain that the Kenyan president Ruto did not go and hang out with all these other presidents 
before these statements were made. For me, that is that is something to hold on to, because this is no longer a conversation about discrete African countries making a political statement about their own country for the benefit of their own country. But we are seeing a coalescing of voices within the black majority world. And that is an important thing. So rather than the African century, what are the sorts of connections we need to be making within the black majority world as folks like me and Motley have called for? Because that for me is where the power lies. Uh, and it's really a, a looking back to sort of the pan-African narrative and black internationalism as the place we need to return to. The second point is that I'm a firm believer in people and movements. I think there are things that we can rely on our, on our governments and heads of state to do, but power is power. The ways in which our politics are structured at this current moment are designed to do very specific things. People pursue power for political and personal interest. Uh, our political structures still continue to exclude the vast majority of people, but there's a strong concerted engagement by social justice movements, by policy think tanks, by academics on the African continent and in the diaspora. And it is to that analysis that we must look to. It is to that engagement that we must look to, to understand how is it that we reposition and re-engage the global stage at this moment when it is evident that things are crumbling, right? Which brings me to my third point. And to use a colloquial term, there's need for a family meeting, <laughs> right? Which is to say, look at what is happening in the globe at this particular moment. If this is not the time, within which we harness our collective voices, then this window might not open again. But that's a family meeting, so I'll not expand what the family meeting needs to, needs to discuss in this space. <laughs> so respond or I can open to further questions. Um, um, just briefly, yeah. follow, following on from that, I think, um, and I've, I've heard of it referred to uh, a lot this time, that, that, that the additional region of Africa, the diaspora, uh, people speaking about issues of race and racism right across the world. I think about the Black Lives Matter movement and how uh, that, that particular resurgence has opened up conversations, um, much of the conversations we've been having today in terms of, of people of Africans descent, African descent's place across the world. And I think um, there will be a forced listening, uh, just as with all of the, the other struggles um, that Black people, working class people have had to, had to fight um, a lot of the time it's not, will they be listened to? It is quite frankly, they will be, people will be forced to listen because there is, there is a certainly a, a common commonality of purpose. And there are some things that people just aren't going to stand for. Okay, brilliant, well said. So now I would like to open the floor to questions. I will take three questions at a time. I, I'm also mindful that there are those particip participating online. So I will try my best to take one or two questions online as well. Um, the gentleman over here, um, the gentleman at the back there, and the, is there any women raising their hands? So, yeah, and the lady over there, thank you. So let's, I'll take you these three and then we will respond and try to have a, a, another round of questions. Uh, thank you very much. I am Dr. Sorry, Ikea Kushi. could you introduce yourself as well? Sorry about that. Um, just come. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, I am Dr. Isia Kushito Al Mustafa of University of Plymouth and a management consultant in port efficiency. My question is very simple. Africans, wherever they come from, is immaterial. What is important is Africans you see themselves as a brother and as a sister. This very concept is what leads Africa not to go forward. People from Africa, instead for them to build a family relationship, they build a animonious or possibly kind of a competing with themselves. A black is black. That's the truth. And that comes to the issue of economy. Doctor, please, I've forgotten your name, please. My Nigerian sister, Ibu Erijin, Glasgow. How can we improve African economy? We have resources, but we export the resources to develop countries. Fine, trading is very important, but 
we are short change of our trading expertise, trading profit, margin, whatever. A very clear example is where you come from, Nigeria. Nigeria is then West African, is West Africa, export food oil, export gas. But you, a lot of news in the last few weeks from Nigeria is crude oil thefts. And crude oil thefts is not just one single person doing it. There are international oil companies operating in Nigeria, Chevron, Shell, what have you, Nigerian National Oil Company, NMPC, Nigerian security officers, and even people from the oil-rich region of Niger Delta. So do we think we are serious as Africans? We have to manage the family first before we can be able to have a louder voice internationally. Thank you. Okay. It's okay. I'll, I'll chair. Go ahead, sir. Um, John Wigley, a uh, member of Chatham House. I'd like to ask the speakers, how would they define the essence, the uniqueness of the black perspective? Because I've heard nothing from the speakers that I, as a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant man, would have been perfectly, would not have been perfectly happy to say. Okay, thank you very much. And yeah, so um, my name is Soraya, I'm a student. And so my question is, we know that there is a tendency of seeing black people as a monolith. So when bringing black voices into conversations, how do we make sure that within that representation, we also represent the multiplicity of voices and of experiences? Because I'm sure you know, the experience of blackness for an African-American, for diasporas in Europe, or for African people within the continent will be different. That's brilliant, thank you very much. I would allow Catherine to respond first, if you can Thank go you ahead. very much. Thank you very much for those questions. On the question of economy, I'm not an economist. I kind of study the political economy of things. And um, it's clear, you know, as uh, my uh, predecessor, you know, former uh, other speakers uh, said, you know, that there is an interconnectedness between the global challenge, the, the, the crisis of capitalism we see and some of the deep structural inequalities that keep our continent where it is. Um, I would just say on the Niger Delta, um, a, a region very dear to me, um, that, and this is connected to also what was said earlier, there are people's movements that for the last 30 years have been challenging that state of affairs and who also are arguing for a future post-oil alternative, an alternative ambition for Nigeria um, uh, you know, uh, in, in terms of, um, you know, climate justice and so on and so forth. So there are ways in which I think we can bring these strands together. Um, and I would very much agree that, um, you, you know, at the realm of ideas, we have serious work to do and there are important trends. Uh, Maya Motley's engagement with the African continent being one, the conversation around reparations being alive and kicking, revived being another, um, the, around, you know, around which there is cause for hope, um, as well as clear, clear sightedness. On the question of the uniqueness of the Black experience, <clears throat> um, the exp I, when I gave my introduction, the reason why I spent so long going on about you know, my own trajectory was in order to be able to demonstrate that this is where I speak from as a Black person, the experience of the, the Black as a condition and the experiences of a racism, um, as well as many other things, um, are multiple. I would not claim or wish to speak um, on behalf of um, um, uh, uh, anyone apart from myself. However, However, um, I do I do think if one is listening very carefully, there are commonalities that all speakers have have see, sought to um, raise, um, and uh, I think it's also important to listen uh, very carefully in order to pick up um, to pick up those the, the, those 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 resonances. I think I'll hand over to the others. Thank you. Thank you. Would you like to respond? Oh, yeah. I, 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 in in terms of the first question and and looking at um issues issues of of e economy and actually division, a lot of uh 
you know, these things, the, the countries in, in the global south were set up on the basis um, of divide and rule. Um, again, I'll, I'll point specifically back to Africa in terms of how the countries were carved up. Some tribes were put in, in, in different places, et cetera. And, and it, there was deliberate underdevelopment um, just to ensure a constant flow of resources uh, from, from the global south uh, to, to the global north. And you see it continued now, even where countries have gained independence, a lot of the time they didn't give back, um, the, the, they, 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 they still don't have the ownership over their natural resources. And, and then we see that neoliberalism continued again, and I, I'll keep talking about aid, some people get upset when I do it, but I, I, I really, really despise the way um, that, 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 that the aid sector is is run um, at the moment, and and the way which it, way which it focuses on competition and, and 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 profit in some cases. And I I that's that's why I look towards the issue of reparations first. Look, I look towards the issue of going uh, beyond aid. And and I was very pleased to hear Catherine touching on 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 looking at going beyond oil, the use of oil. When I think about the way in which certain comp organizations have worked in 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 the global south, I, again I think to myself. You may have energy issues, for example, um, but instead you're going and taking this so-called aid money and plugging it into uh, private companies uh, to continue to provide failing um, energy systems. I point to countries like Ghana and Nigeria, where we will routinely have things such as light off. Um, although my cousin did call me and say, I hear you're about to have light off in the UK. <laughs> Do you have a generator? <laughs> That's going to be interesting uh, when that eventually happens. Um, but 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 you see things like that happen there. Why would you not, if it's not about sustaining aid in the way it is, look towards what is the best resource of energy that you could? Sun. Why would there not be all of these companies, all of these so-called NGOs, organisations working towards making sure that um, countries that they were meant to be re that helping to develop could sustain themselves through renewable energy and things like that? Why? Because again, it doesn't it doesn't benefit them. It doesn't benefit um, 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 that, that, that type of system. And 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 just to touch on 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 the issue of that the, the multiplicity of of, of of different voices, I, I I do understand there's so many different nuances in terms of how we experience things, how we experience things here as black people, and how we experience things um um in on on the continent from from Caribbean, different Western countries, um, but. I would say that there is a huge commonality. And whilst we shouldn't look beyond those, those differences in terms of explaining our experience, I think at the moment we have uh, one common, common um, enemy and that's racism. And, and as long as we are joining together uh, to fight that, I think in some way, some of those differences uh, fall away without taking away from our own individual experience, but, but absolutely making sure that we are facing um, head on the hugest challenge that we have because again going back to my first point there's been so much work done to divide and and rule us and stop us from challenging that together thank you Amina I would just hold for another round of questions over here the gentleman at the front um, the lady here in the turtleneck and the lady at the back in the yes thank you great thank you uh, hi there, my name is Max. I'm a Chatham House member. I have a question for the Right Honourable Member. Um, you spoke earlier about how there's an important distinction between diversity versus representation. And this is something I wanted to ask you about, because right now, for example, people are making quite a lot of the fact that we have the most ethnically diverse cabinet, political cabinet in history. And that's obviously fantastic. But when you look at the socioeconomic backgrounds of these people, for the most part, they're, you know, private school educated, often upper middle class people. We don't have people from, you know, lower socioeconomic backgrounds, people who have grown up on council estates, really working class. So, so yeah, could, could you please speak about how, you, you know, a, a bit more about this distinction and how with diversity, there's a danger of it becoming a kind of shallow kind of diversity, a diversity of skin color, but not a real diversity of people of different, you know, class backgrounds and that sort of thing. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, um, I'm a teacher of Warnerock. I'm um, an MA student at King's College London um, doing international relations. And this question is for um, Catherine and Dr. Alvino. So at the end of her speech, Catherine mentioned um, the idea of um, kind of race, the link between late race and power in international relations. And I'm just wondering whether either of you could um, expand more on the idea of um, how race 
translates into macro relations between different countries around the world um, in that sense. Thank you. I really listened and I really enjoyed. I just wanted to add in, in terms of uh, perhaps the Black perspective on international relations. My name is Numi Ajibade, member of Chatham House. Um, the first thing is I, I, I see, I, I take it that it is a personal trajectory. So when I look at Africa, I look at it and I say to myself, is anything around happening in Africa that makes African continent a buffer state? Now, if you look around the world, you see that the West have, have allowed and facilitated um, investment and the transfer of technology to countries where they are clear strategic buffer states. So for instance, in recent times, we found out that, I'll say this really quickly, Ukraine was supplying wheat to African countries, refugees. Now, if you look at Africa, wheat is not our staple. It's actually maize, millet, right? But strategically, Ukraine is on the border of Russia. If you look at Korea, South Korea, it has transferred technology from the United States. It is a buffer state to North Korea. If you look at Taiwan, I'm sorry. So, but that's what I wanted to question, say, because please. if you're looking for that is the perspective, and then you have to ask yourself, so what does Africa have? If you're looking at it in that sense, what does Africa, what is Africa buffering that would make someone spend 20, 30 billion or a trillion as a buffer state to ensure that they get money back? Um, the second point I was going to make was, was that, which is the question, was that um, in terms of reparations, it's funny, I, I watched this, the, the, the Woman King, and I think everyone should go watch it, actually, it's quite nice. But it's very interesting about that. The question is, if, you want, if we want reparation, then do we not have to deal with African history? Like the Woman King taught me I'm something. Sorry, ma'am, can you um, Okay, very... I'm sorry. The Woman King taught me something that I never knew. I always thought the, the, the old oil empire stretched from where I am, Ilarogu, right down to uh, uh, Sierra Leone, but apparently it didn't, because this film tells us that Dome thought it was independent and a kingdom of its own, and that it was enslaved by the Oyo Empire, and the people in Oyo sold the people of Dome to the Europeans. And that's why yeah, I see the question of reparations. Please. Thank you very Thank much. You. <laughs> okay, and then finally, I just want to give some attention to the online questions from Saleh Camille Saleh, what are your views on African exceptionalism being used to justify bad governance by the partial use of legitimate criticisms of colonial wrongs? Um, so that will be the fourth question. Catherine, can we start with you again? Oh, I always get the short straw, Never mind. Um, <laughs> let me take a few of these the, the questions. Um, let me take the last one on, on bad governance, and I link it to uh, some of the things that were said earlier. You know, um, I think when we're looking at Africa, our dear continent, that it's important to look with clear eyes at Africa's history and what Africa's nation states that we describe them today are how they became. And because if you start to engage with a conversation around reparations, it's important also to, you know, to, to refer back to that history. And there's some interesting work on reparations um, that really starts to think and force, you know, encourage us to think about um, the unit of the nation state as, as and whether and whether really um, that's fair, it's fair, it's a fair unit to be um, a, a basing an analysis or assessment of progress on, given the ways in which these nation states were created in the first place and their relative um, of recent, uh, recent creation. So that question of bad governance, I would turn on its head actually, and say that for me, one of the big challenges um, that uh, Africa has is even um, statehood and nationhood. What is that? Because I think um, it's it's really critical when we're thinking of you know what 
political imagination needs to look like, what ideas about the future of the continent needs to look like, that we engage, you know, what 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 community what is that political community that is the nation state and is that something upon which we can build our future i think the observations on buffer states are very well received um i'm not in a position to answer them but i would also turn that on its head and say perhaps that rather than uh, rather than continuing to think what's in it for others with respect to africa's future africa needs Africans need to think about what is in it for us. What do we want and how do we want to build our future? And then, you know, um, engage that conversation about what, you know, who's doing what, who's scratching who's back. On the question of wheat and Ukraine, I mean, I think it's really worth continuing to ponder this um, anomaly <laughs> that someone suggested, you know, we have millet, uh, so why wheat? I spent a long time in a country called Senegal. There's a big debate there about the role which uh, the president has played in pushing this, you know, narrative of we are reliant on Ukraine's wheat and therefore we need to... Con because actually, if you think, why is, why is Senegal reliant on, on, on wheat imports from Ukraine? Because of the whole, the whole economy around food production and its um, colonial uh, overhang, you know, no, no, no Senegalese worth his salt would, you know, would not be without their baguette bread in French style baguette bread um, is common uh, as and, and very poor nutritious value in Dakar, you know, but Thank that you. unraveling that is a political question and an historical one. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, it's OK. Thank you. I'm just mindful that we have five minutes left. Um, Alina, would you like to respond? Yeah, sure. So mm, three quick points. On the question of race and international relationships, I would say Berlin Conference. I would say think about the ways in which Bolsonaro mobilized his campaign to come into office and the current contestations that are happening in, uh, in Brazil right now and the mobilization of you know, far right and fundamentalist uh, and evangelical churches as part of the process of, of making a claim to a certain kind of Brazil that is very anti-Black very anti-queer, very anti-everything that is not presented as white Brazilian. But Berlin Conference, that is how you understand how race and IR is so intertwined and the legacies that continue from that, which goes to the point about the economy, right? How do we conceive of a moment in 2022 where you still have a bulk of West African French-speaking countries whose economic structure is hardwired to a connection to France, right? that their currency is pegged to French currency, that their resources have to be sold to France first before other people have a look in, right? So those legacies are alive and well. And of course, we must take responsibility for how it is that we want to reconfigure our relationships with the global world and within our own countries. But we cannot deny that this, the, the global economic infrastructure is so deep and strong, and that the work to do it has to be, has to happen across contract, contexts and across countries. So it's not something that Kenya resolves on its own. It's not something that East Africa resolves on its own. It requires a sort of global momentum to shift this on its head. And where have we seen evidence of that happening and it being thwarted? Cuba, right? So I think it's important for us to be honest with each other that the struggle here is about power. People don't give power away, right? In order to get power, you have to wrestle with it. And that's why I keep on saying that the place that we must look to are the voices, the scholarship, scholar activists, intellectuals that are imagining these alternatives. I wouldn't want us to leave here today thinking that there are no Africans who are thinking about alternatives, that there are no Africans who are challenging and questioning and raising uh, uh, different forms of, of, of ideas and alternatives, both in the international sphere, but also nationally to challenge their own governments. Those movements are alive and well, and that thinking is alive and well. But if we take seriously how power functions in our societies, this is not a task that we're going to win on our own. And my brother would invite you that if these are arguments you're making, let's join forces, because there has to be a reason why our voices are marginalized. And if we join forces with you and you're making the same political, structural and quality arguments, 
then we have far to go together, right? So this is not a question of what is the uniqueness of the black perspective, if I can say this. If you're both saying the same thing, let's work together. Because ultimately what we are trying to do here is to shift the infrastructure apart. It's not to remove you from your own country. This world of ours and these borders that we have created are artificial at the end of the day. Thank you. I will give you one minute, sorry, uh, to, <laughs> to, to encapsulate tonight's conversation. To ask a quick question about diversity and, and representation. There was a period of time where people talked um, a lot about increasing representation in politics and, and what they meant was for people who had the most lived experiences um, to be able to go into politics and to represent those views. Unfortunately, it's now become an issue of diversity. And so people, just because they, they may look like that particular group or identify it with some way, are being put there. And actually, they're being put there on the basis that they may even argue against okay. uh, the group that they, they, they represent. So we have to be really, really careful about that and make sure that we're, we're, we are, um, that representation or diversity is met with, with, with action as opposed to just uh, being a face in a place. Um, and, and just just to end on just one point about reparations, uh, people always ask um, how how on earth could you figure out exactly how you're going to pay reparations? Who do you pay it to? When do you pay it? Who gets X? Who gets Y? But I think the best way to start looking at it is that there is no amount of money and um, there is no amount of actions that you could take that could properly equate for what was done um, in, in terms of slavery, in terms of colonialism. It is not possible so you start where you can and um that's that's all i believe that people are asking for in terms of the reparations movement asking people to start where they can and to make sure that at wherever they can that um black people people of african descent those those in in, in countries that were colonized right across the world are put on an equal footing brilliant well said thank you everyone can we just give our panelists a round of applause